uh, wonderful to welcome uh, Dr. Tracy Bliss um, and talking about her book, uh, Big Basin Redwood Forest. As a young girl, Tracy Bliss made a promise to her relative, Jenny Bliss Peter, that she would never forget how Big Basin had been saved, specifically that women were absolutely essential. But as time moved on, Tracy never saw or heard of a single piece of state parks information about the role uh, that, of women in saving our oldest state park. This omission so haunted her, she made a life-changing decision. Though she loved her career as a full professor of education, she actually retired early to begin a decade-long journey of discovery. Tonight, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Tracy Bliss because she plans to go even deeper than the book itself, offering a unique insight into Santa Cruz County and its deep commitment to our redwoods. Tracy's volunteer activities include serving as a docent and docent trainer at Henry Cowell Redwood State Park and as a commissioner for Santa Cruz um, Historic Preservation, also as a third generation member of Santa Cruz Rotary. Please welcome Dr. Tracy Bliss. Thank you, Lisa. What a treat to be here. Can everyone hear me? Is the sound good? It's okay, great. terrific. I'm especially excited about this talk because this piece of the story that I'm going to go into <clears throat> more depth really focuses on the San Lorenzo Valley. And it's a piece of the story, many pieces of the story got left out over time. And while I started with the women who got left out, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I found all kinds of other incredible people whose stories needed to be brought in. And certainly the story of those individuals in the San Lorenzo Valley. So that's gonna be a major focus tonight. And Lisa, can we start with the book cover? Would that be okay? Yep. There we go. Okay, so yeah, um, so Tracy, this is a beautiful, for a historic book. I mean, you, typically this is, this, this is a book that's been produced by History Press. Their books are very often kind of, you know, sepia. This is a beautiful, beautiful cover. Can you tell me about, tell us about this, um, how this cover came about? Thank you. You know that I love the cover. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing I want to tell you is that why did I call this book Big Basin Redwood Forest when all the literature mostly says, or the brochures, it's called Big Basin Redwoods or Big, Re Big Basin Redwood State Park? I called it Redwood Forest because the early preservationists, and they didn't have the term conservation then in 1900, they called themselves preservationists. They always said, we are preserving a redwood forest. That was what they were preserving. So that's what I wanted in the title. But I also discovered along the way that here Big Basin is the first um, state park in the United States, which is actually a forest. There were other state parks in New York, but Big Basin was the first that was a forest. And in the forest history books, like forest history in America, deforestation, Big Basin isn't even a footnote. It's not mentioned. And that's because forest has never been in the title. So in addition to being um, historically accurate, I think we can look forward to a lot more scholarship in the future about Big Basin because people will now find it in the database under forests. And I think that's an exciting thing to look forward to. Um, the I love the idea that this cover captures a century at Big Basin. The photo at the at the top, now it's in the middle of the book where there are 32 gorgeous color photos and in more detail with credits and so on. Um, and that of course is Route 236 North coming into Big Basin before the CZU fire. 
On the bottom of the book, can you pull it up just a bit? This is so um, this is so important a find, a discovery. Those of us who've worked with Big Basin, we didn't even know this painting by Andrew P. Hill existed six months ago. It was at it's at History San Jose, and it's one of the only oil paintings that Andrew P. Hill did of Big Basin. And the reason why it's, it has all this special meaning is it was actually commissioned by our supervisor, by the Valley supervisor, Bruce McPherson. His great grandfather, Duncan McPherson, was the owner and editor of the Santa Cruz Sentinel. And he was very important in the saving of Big Basin. He commissioned this painting, he commissioned Andrew P. Hill to do this painting for the 1915 Pan Pacific Exhibition in San Francisco. So the world that was coming to San Francisco to see it after the earthquake could see the beauty of the Redwoods. And one of the very fun things, and Bruce loves this aspect, and nobody in the McPherson family even knew this picture existed, are the three women are all members of the McPherson family. And the one farthest to the right is Bruce's great grandmother. So it really has a lot of meaning for the San Lorenzo Valley. And I'm so thrilled that we have, we were able to use it for the cover. Thank you. I'm gonna stop my share right now. Okay. So Tracy, what? made the movement to preserve Big Basin so unique? And why is the story that you tell in this book so different from the traditional story that we've heard? I, I would say that the story that I'm capturing in this book is a story of extraordinary grassroots community action of so many different groups from Stanford, from San Jose, from Santa Cruz, coming together to say, we need to save the Redwoods. And I've had the benefit of, as you know, Lisa, for the last several years, all these newspapers have come online. So in the past, people didn't have access to all these different stories and being able to merge them into one story. And so the previous story was always the one great man story. You all who've been docents at Big Basin, who've spent time there, you remember near the father of the forest tree, there was the fountain with the display that uh, said in memory of the public service of Andrew P. Hill. And then underneath it said very boldly, he saved the Redwoods as though it was a one man um, I, I, I don't even know what to say, like a one man accomplishment. The problem with that is that if we buy into that narrative, which was often the narrative a um, hundred years ago, the one great man theory of history, it so diminishes the accomplishment because it took the whole state of California to save Big Basin. It took networks all over the state people who'd never, women who had never seen Redwoods all coming together and lobbying the legislature to say, we need to do this. It's the right thing to do. And I don't know, Lisa, if you want me to talk about the women at this point or uh, San Lorenzo Valley, I mean, which direction would you like me to go in, in the interest of time? I, I you know, I think, I, I think talking about, you know, what, what women were going through at that time and what brought them together is extremely interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> in 1896, women throughout California had fought very hard to, in an attempt to get the right to vote, suffrage. And uh, there were many, many women's groups in California at that time, women's clubs all over of having differing agendas for different topics. The Daughters of the American Revolution, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Native Daughters of the Golden West, and of course, the suffragists. 
Now, there were a lot of women in a lot of organizations that didn't want suffrage and they didn't think it was appropriate or it was too much too soon. So when suffrage did not pass, and actually in Santa Cruz, it actually did pass, but Santa Cruz was not the state. Um, these women still had all these networks, these suffragists did. Okay, fast forward three and a half years to the start of the Big Basin Movement, and you have the San Jose Women's Club as this model of women who had been in all these different organizations, and they were still in those organizations. But they said, let's have a club where we put aside our differences and we can come together and have speak with one voice for one cause. So the San Jose Women's Club, I love this piece of data from about, I think it was, oh, 1894, over the next six, seven years, they went from seven members to 200 members. So you have this club of women who have are have all kinds of time that they can devote to causes and they make Big Basin their cause. And they have so much talent. They are many journalists in it. And I call the San Jose Women's Club of the late um, 1800s the, this breeding ground for activism because it's exactly what it was. So what happens with the movement is these women are so excited because redwoods are something everybody can agree on. And then the women from the San Jose Women's Club activate their other networks throughout the state that they're part of, whether it's the DAR or the, the um, Native Daughters of the Golden West. And you have women all over the state um, really saying, we want our redwoods preserved. So when the president of the San Jose Women's Club goes to, to um, testify to the legislature, uh, she, Mrs. E.O. Smith, she had been a leader of the suffragists. Now she can say to the legislature, all the women of California want our trees saved. We all speak with one voice. And it was so compelling because that hadn't been the case three and a half years earlier. So I don't have any um, hard data to prove this, but I think it was very much the case that women felt we lost our attempt to get the right to vote. We're not going to lose our trees because at that point in time, it will, you know, of course, it's our California tree, but California didn't own a single specimen of redwood. That's a, that's a really interesting point that California did not own a single specimen of redwood. You know, it's amazing, right? It is, it is. And I think Lisa, one of the things that is so important for all of us when we think of this, the importance of this movement, I know everyone likes to say, well, it was the beginning of the conservation movement. That's true. But when you think of preserving the redwoods and that, in 1800, we had 2 million acres of redwood forest, of coastal redwoods in California. And we have 5% of that today. If these individuals had not come together from all over to say Big Basin, what would that percentage be? 2%, 1%? I, I mean, they were, it was the tipping point. That's what is so extraordinary. They didn't know that, but that what they did ensured that the 100,000 acres of redwoods, coastal redwoods that we have left, that we have 100,000 acres of coastal redwoods, of, of old growth coastal redwoods left in California. Before we go on to the next question, Tracy, just touch on the women of Los Angeles. Well, Lisa is kind of an expert on this topic because she did the transcription. But when the governor, the Republican governor, the legislature finally came together after intense lobbying by all these different groups and they passed the California Redwood Park Bill. And but the governor, 
he was he was in a hot spot because people in Southern California wanted money for a water bill and um, Northern Californians wanted the Redwoods. And so the governor couldn't make up his mind. And he's like all these all these people from Santa Cruz and all over are bombarding his office. But the women of L.A., the native daughters of the Golden West, a thousand of them signed a petition and sent that to the legislature, save our trees, assign the bill. But then when the governor is in complete, like, what do I do, what do I do? They sent a telegram every two minutes, all day long, sign the Redwood Park bill. And at the end of the day, there are all these men that are lobbying him, but that doesn't make a difference. At the end of the day, I think that, I don't know how many hundreds of telegrams he got. He just finally said, I give up. I signed and I'll sign the Redwood Park bill. And I don't think those women in LA had probably ever seen a Redwood, but they knew they wanted the forest saved. It's just, just an amazing story. Okay, so um, there were two men, actually good friends from Boulder Creek that played vital roles in the creation and the long-term development of the park. Can you tell us about them and what made their contributions so special? Oh, thank you. I love this question. So picture, picture Boulder Creek um, in like the eight, eight, 1890s. And um, it has a population of 500 people. And the unofficial mayor of Boulder Creek is a very successful businessman. Um, logging was his major enterprise named Henry Middleton. He um, He's, he really is the unofficial mayor of Boulder Creek. And he also owns the water company. He's co-owner of the dry goods store. And by the by the eight by 1898, he's built a <clears throat> excuse me, 16-room hotel at the junction of 236 and Highway 9, you know, right where Johnny's uh, market is today. So he was really Mr. Boulder Creek. Okay, so fast forward to 1898, and Henry Middleton has, he owns a small section of Big Basin. The rest of Big Basin land, the, the, it's not all of it because there were homesteaders, but the major section of Big Basin land that was prime forest was owned by Timothy Hopkins, the adopted son of Mark Hopkins, one of the big four owners of the Southern Pacific Railroad. You know, that's the most um, important monopoly uh, in California. So the Timothy Hopkins story is extraordinary and jaw dropping, but too long for this talk. And it's all in the book. But what happened is, is Middleton was trying to get some of his logs, his cut logs out of the park, what would become the park, out of Big Basin, which he'd, he'd already done. He was a logger. And all of a sudden, Timothy Hopkins has put up a fence, which means Henry Middleton can no longer log Big Basin. Well, he has a contract for, these, for, for this timber. What is he going to do? Well, it turns out that Henry Middleton, his probably best friend throughout his life, was the most significant politician in the region, a man by the name of William Jeter. And Jeter and Middleton had built the Democratic Party together in Santa Cruz County, which is what made Will Jeter the first Democrat to become district attorney. And so by this time, the eight, eight late 1890s, Will Jeter has become the first Santa Cruzan to be um, hold statewide office, and he's the lieutenant governor. So he has this position as lieutenant governor, um, and Middleton is in this real fix. What's he going to do? And Jeter does what he always does. Middleton was also really important, Jeter's client, because Jeter is also the president of the Santa Cruz County Bank. It's, isn't it amazing when you think, I mean, these people wore so many hats at the same time, so many hats. And so what Jeter does is he creates this rapprochement, this meeting between Middleton and Hopkins, and they create the Big Basin Lumber Company. 
And obviously what had happened is Middleton made this decision that he would make his land part of what Hopkins owned at Big Basin, and he could get lumber to fulfill his contract from some other source that Hopkins had. The moment that the Big Basin Lumber Company is formed, it means the state can deal with one entity and it's possible then for the state to acquire land. You know, it would not be possible for the state to deal with, you know, two, three different entities. So the Big Basin Lumber Company is formed and one week later, Jeter holds a meeting at Stanford University, May 1st, with all these businessmen, um, uh, academics from all over, and they all look at this data about Big Basin, these beautiful maps provided by a Stanford professor, and they vote to save Big Basin. Where Henry Middleton becomes so essential to this movement is two weeks later, he helps to make um, an excursion into Big Basin happen. And let's show the picture of Henry Middleton. Okay. So that's Henry Middleton when he's an older man. When he's younger, he has this big handlebar mustache and he's always a little portly, but just this man of extraordinary generosity. Everybody who was part of this movement, I think brought in unique skills, but Middleton had this generosity of heart and spirit so what he does, why did we have to have these expeditions or excursions into Big Basin? Because the park was so remote. From Santa Cruz to get into Big Basin was a full day journey. You had to change trains three times. And then from once you got to Boulder Creek, it was 13 miles over a old pothole road in a wagon. So it was an ordeal to get to Big Basin. So Henry Middleton and Santa Cruz businessmen say, we've got to get buy-in so people can experience Big Basin. Maybe a few hundred people had camped at Big Basin. But, so, but it wasn't like you could go and see it like you, know, you could afterwards. So what Henry Middleton did was he would outfit all these excursions into Big Basin, giving people... Um, all the camping equipment they needed. I mean, imagine like you hear about African safaris and you go and you have all of the tents and everything you need and the transportation and the food. Henry Middleton personally, you know, through the Big Basin Lumber Company made that possible. And he took on this role of this is my home. I'm the host. Come and experience these great wonders of the world. And I just think that he was such an extraordinary man, his humility and he, his shepherding of people through the park and giving them these wonderful experiences. So Lisa, let's show, um, let's show folks how this excursion happened with um, Henry Middleton's hotel, if we have that slide. So there's the commercial hotel picture Johnny's Market today. And here is this group of people who represent different organizations, May 1900. These are the people that are going to go into the park. They are not, they are not yet these devoted conservation preservationists. These are individuals who need to be taken into the park and have this, you know, aha experience. And they represent the Association of um, Fish and Game. They represent the two women, Carrie Stevens Walter, Louise Coffin Jones, the San Jose Women's Club, Andrew P. Hill, the San Jose Board of Trade, and um, a supervisor from San Francisco. So the whole point of this is to get their buy in. And they get to Big Basin. You all know this story. They have the Epiphany experience and they form the Semper Byron's Club which was to be the publicity arm for the movement. Why this picture from the San Lorenzo Valley Museum is so significant is that this then for the next seven, eight months is what Middleton does consistently. Stay at my hotel, 
and I will get you into Big Basin and give you beautiful food um, and, and meals there. Carrie Stevens Walter writes about um, even preservationists can't live on scenery alone in complimenting um, Middleton. So he loved this role. Imagine trans transforming himself from this major lumberman, which he still did, into this total gracious host for taking people and having them have this immersion experience in Big Basin. Thank you, Tracy. So you mentioned two people, um, the second, who's the second? Oh, so, um, the this will this is kind of fast forward and um what happens there's the preservationists had no idea what they had signed on for and they had a decade of one challenge after another and the finally by 1911 they have some stability but up until that Point, a lot of the fighting was with the state bureaucracy, the uh, forestry board, who were not being diligent or, I mean, actually Henry Middleton called it um, legalized vandalism because they were cutting down trees that had been burned in the 1905 for fire. They'd been scarred, but they weren't dead but the state was authorizing them being cut down because labor, because um, redwood had become so extraordinarily valuable. And so these preservationists thinking that they had signed on for a year, actually they, it took them a decade. So by 1911, things stabilized and they got a governor, Hiram Johnson. He was a Teddy Roosevelt Republican and he really believed in conservation. They kicked out the old forestry board who, most people thought was corrupt. And they reinstated the um, Redwood Park, California Redwood Park board. And Middleton was actually appointed to that board. Now imagine, here's this Republican governor and Henry Middleton is a key figure in the Democratic party and he gets appointed. So what Hiram Johnson, the governor was saying is, look, expertise and commitment are far more important to me than party loyalty. I love that piece. So what happens then is that they fire the bad guy from Boulder Creek. Um, his name was Rambo. <laughs> his name really was Rambo. And um, he was a businessman in the lumber business and other things in Boulder Creek. And he had been part of allowing the, he'd been the warden, the second warden, and he'd been a part of allowing um, this rape of the Redwoods to happen. He got fired, his assistant got hired, fired, and who do they appoint for the next warden, but a close friend of Henry Middleton's named Billy Duell. And I just met Billy Duell's great, great granddaughter for the first time this past week. And she tells the story of for 20 years as the third warden from um, 1911 to 1931, what his passion was, was bringing families every summer to Big Basin and having them have this immersion experience, totally immersed in the rhythms and the beauty of Big Basin. And I saw that as this wonderful extension of what the original preservationists had wanted for Big Basin to be preserved in a state of nature and for people to get to experience that. And that's what Billy Duell did during his time as warden. Lisa, you may know more about this than I do, but it seems to me from everything I can tell that the really massive construction that happened in Big Basin really occurred in the 1930s with the Civilian Conservation Corps. And up until that time, there were a few buildings and, um, and but there wasn't this massive um, construction that happened during the 30s. In 1930, 31, it, I think we could say that the beginning of the depression was kind of the end of the era of the preservationists. Um, in that year, 
um, William Jeter, Henry Wendleton, and Billy Duell all in those that year and a half, they all died. And at the same time, the incredible woman journalist, Louise Coffin Jones, who's on the back of the book, she also passed on. It is this amazing feeling that all four of these individuals who loved Big Basin so much and brought different skills all kind of said goodbye at the same time. So Tracy, you touched on what you called the rape of the Redwoods. Can you elaborate on what Rambo was doing? Okay, the background of that is picture San Francisco, 1906. 350,000 people living in San Francisco, and it's the height of San Francisco's Gilded Age. And meanwhile, Santa Cruz County has 25,000 people. I just putting it into demographic perspective. Um, and it's April 17th. And later historians will say on April 17th, there has never been a greater display of wealth in the history of San Francisco. And if you go to the newspapers of that day, April 17th, 1906, column after column, I actually had to bring this out, out so you could see. So it just talks about the incredible, can you see that, uh, the diamonds? It just talks about these women's diamonds after diamonds, they were dripping, dripping in diamonds and because the San Francisco opera and, it was Carmen and every socialite was decked out in diamonds and ermine. And you all know the story, six hours later is the San Francisco earthquake, which basically not only flattened San Francisco, but these intense fires that were really unstoppable. But what happens when it's finally gotten under control is they realize there are a few places in San Francisco that didn't burn and why didn't they burn? And these pictures in the book, thank you to the Forest History Society for providing them to us. These pictures show that the only places that didn't burn was because they had redwood facades. Well, what happens? The, the the stampede for Redwood is just, I mean, it's that then becomes unstoppable. And within a few months, the price of Redwood, it, it said it it the profits went up 500 percent in six months for Redwood. OK, so now six months later, that's when Rambo authorizes um, loggers to go into Big Basin and cut down what were supposedly burned trees, but were very much living, according to the Stanford botanist. And so the all of these Semper Byrons and these preservationists, they have to get back together, they have to start putting pressure on the state, and they have to stop this. But it was a really horrific battle, and the person who really led that battle was the Santa Cruz journalist working for Duncan McPherson at the Sentinel named Josephine McCracken. And she was just as diligent as you can possibly imagine in, in calling out what she called the, the, this, this terrible rape of the redwoods, that cutting down trees that were absolutely not dead for profit. So finally, they got that under control. And Henry Middleton did say it was legalized vandalism. And so that was why by 1911, they needed to replace Rambo and they got Billy Duell in his place. So there are these three men, two really good guys and one kind of scoundrel. Uh, one piece of data says that Rambo only spent about two hours a week being going into Big Basin because he was so busy managing his own businesses. He got paid $125 a month. That was the salary for a warden back then. So Tracy, we're coming up to um, 6.45 now. I'd like you to, 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 to just talk about what you envisage for the, uh, for the park going forward. Tell us about your, you know, what you, what you see is going to happen. Well, I, I, um, 
I envision that the effort that is underway now called Reimagining Big Basin that the state parks has totally embraced with a very diverse and inclusive um, advisory group, uh, that they are working on all of the issues that, uh, you know, a, a huge number of issues. And I really believe that they're going to come up with a, a plan for what will the park look like in the future that represents a, a whole lot of voices, but it means all of us have to make our voices heard. I urge all of you to go to reimaginingbigbasin.org. Lisa, if you could put that on the, on the I, chat. I have put it in the chat. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, I just did this last night. It was so much fun. And they now have a place where you get to share your memories. And it's a very, very fun thing to do with a beautiful, the map is so good. The map is beautiful, a big basin and the places that mean the most to you, but also getting to say, why was this memory important to you? And I love doing that. And I hope the rest of you will want to do it as well. And then when there are start to be more public forums that we all participate and allow this process to take its course. Um, for me personally, Lisa, I've been a docent for 11 years and at Henry Cowell. And of course, that's also meant spending time at Big Basin. And I think we have a great opportunity as docents because our stories as the book shows between Saving Henry Cowell and Saving Big Basin so overlap that we have an opportunity here to, to just embrace like new possibilities for docenting and in terms of how much more inclusive we can be in our stories and in who is actually serving as a docent. So I don't I I'm I don't have any specifics. I just think that there are lots of opportunities for creativity and innovation. And I hope like with the saving of Big Basin, all of you will want to participate in the process and give your opinion because I know it's going to be really valued. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, we have about 15 minutes uh, left. I want to um, just thank Trace, Dr. Tracy Bliss for uh, her insights. Tracy, the book uh, is, is, is a wonderful book. You go into so much depth. Um, uh, you know, I really encourage folks to, 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 to read the book. But I also um, want to encourage those who are here tonight, if you're not a member of the museum, you want to become a member of the museum, I'd really encourage you to do that. And I'm going to put a link in the chat before we take questions um, to becoming a member. Um, please do that. So, so folks, have you got any questions for uh, Dr. Bliss? Let me just scroll back here. Hi, this is Hugh. Uh, I'm wondering what's the current status of Big Basin relative to any type of uh, visitation? All of that information is on um, the Reimagining website and Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks has just done this wonderful job as, as have the parks also, but of providing videos showing where the, the cleanup process is, how much has been already accomplished. And I mean, this huge need to make Big Basin safe again. And I just know for myself, I don't think anybody knows when the park or pieces of the park are going to be reopened. But my experience is that the park staff are really working around the clock to make that happen. For myself, I've enjoyed, which I never really did very much before, going to Rancho Del Oso, the piece of the park that is open. And the Marsh Trail, it's a short trail, not quite a mile, but 
It's so special. I took my niece from Georgia um, on the Marsh Trail a couple of months ago, and she goes, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm at my favorite park in Savannah, Georgia, because of all of the moss on these trees. And it's true. It's not like any other park in California, because it is a marshland. And I know there that Save the Redwoods League and the Waddell Creek Association, they've um, both given funding to make an additional visitor center and outlook there. So I, I think that's one thing that is fun to do while we're waiting for Big Basin to partially and slowly reopen. So, so Tracy, I know you wrote, um, I wrote a, a, a little about the um, uh, the 1904 fire in in the book right can you can you can you draw any parallels between that and the CCU fire wow um I've thought so much about this topic um in 1904 when we had the fire in Big Basin the park had only been open for three months the conditions on the ground were almost exactly similar to the CCU fire there had been a terrible drought. There had been a week long heat wave throughout the county of more than 100 degrees every day. And the fire in 1904 was caused by lightning. Now, a huge difference was that the multiple fires that were going on in Big Basin did not converge like they did with the CZU fire in Big Basin, which is what caused the park literally to burn overnight. That, you know, initially they thought it was controllable. What I found so fascinating, Lisa, about that 1904 fire, and thank you so much for that incredible picture that you gave us for the book of showing the women evacuating who were camping there, is that they had no equipment, they had no communication, they didn't even have proper fire clothing. And as with the CZU fire, very minimal um, state resources for the enormity of the task. The reason that fire got put out was because the private sector jumped in. And the private sector then meant um, all of these lumbermen from Bloom's Mill, on the outskirts of Big Basin, and also um, those working for the Southern Pacific Railroad linemen. They all rushed up, they risked their lives, but together hundreds of them were able to put out the fire. And that idea of the private sector jumping in as volunteers along with, this is a great piece of the story that I really go into detail in the book, is that you had 12 undergraduates from Stanford who were mobilized and they, they had all helped to make trails at Big Basin with a professor there. And they actually saved Pescadero Creek, that whole Pescadero area of Big Basin. So all these volunteers, people who had never been firemen before had ju just rushed to Big Basin to save it. It's a pretty um, heartwarming story. Wonderful, thank you. Um, any other questions? Or you can put your questions in the chat box. Um, any, any other questions for us? So, um, so Tracy, we touched uh, briefly on right at the beginning. You know, your um, your your leaving the uh, your professorship um, in education to. Um, to pursue this story. Do you feel that you are at the end of that journey or do you think there's still more to go, to come? Um, <laughs> uh, sort of, um, people keep asking me, well, what book is next? And my honest answer is this, because of the CZU fire and because of the commitment of, so many people at Big Basin and the losses that they went through, uh, the staff there, it's just, they're just extraordinary individuals. I call the theme of the book, resilient commitment. It was resilient way back with Henry Middleton and the women. And 
it, it's resilient today. And I'd like to contribute whatever I can to Big Basin going forward. And I don't think that means being chained to my computer writing another book. I'd like to be giving talks like this, um, to helping people to understand the extraordinary legacy that we have, the amazing sacrifices of so many people that created Big Basin and help to build the momentum for a, a reimagined Big Basin. And of course, you know, my mantra going forward is the same as it would have been for them, which is I hope that when Big Basin is reimagined, that there will probably be, um, you know, less congestion, there'll be easier ways, there'll be much better designs, there'll be a master plan for parking and traffic and uh, all the things that staff there have had, the challenges that they've had. Um, I read a whole piece that Susan Blake told me for the book about what it was like for them during COVID when everybody was trying to come to Big Basin and trying to manage the huge influx of interest in Big Basin. So I just, I don't know what that would look like, but I hope that, I hope to be a part in some small way of, uh, of helping the effort to have Big Basin reopen again safely and um, wonderfully for the public. So thank you so much, Tracy. This has been a great talk. I, I wanna compliment you on a, on a beautiful book. It's so unusual to have a history book that has beautiful color photographs in the center. Um, can, you know, I'm not sure how you manage that with History Press, but, um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, a beautiful addition to a, to a, great, um, a, a, a great story. Well, Lisa, I also, for, for those of you who don't know, early on, I got some pushback trying to tell this story. And there were a few docents at Big Basin that really loved the old story. And Lisa was one of those individuals early on um, that just totally embraced this, really helped and supported me. And uh, you know, the first, the, my first attempt with Randall Brown is in the book that Lisa edited, A Split History of Conservation and Logging in the San Lorenzo Valley, so uh, the Santa Cruz Mountain Redwoods. So Lisa, also my heartfelt thanks to you and to the wonderful archive at the San Lorenzo Valley Museum. I'm a life member of the museum and I am so proud to be able to support uh, the wonderful work that goes on there in preserving Valley history. Well, thank you. Thank you. Any last questions for Tracy? Okay, then well, let me just check the chat one more time. So we're getting thanks coming in Tracy on the chat. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Tracy, for a great talk.